Thank you, Andre. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's actually quite embarrassing. It's only the second time in Bonn, and on the first time, uh, Bonn was still home of the German government. So I think that changed in 1999, something like this. So it's a, it's a long time. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, I want to speak about a joint project with uh, Giuseppe Savaré from Pavia and Alexander Mirke. And now I should also add Varios, maybe, who also started <laughs> to work on this project. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can also go to Varios. He's happy to talk about this topic, too. Okay, so what do I want to tell you? Uh, I want to give you, uh, I want to show you that so-called entropy transport problems are a natural uh, generalization uh, of optimal transport for arbitrary measures, so measures that don't necessarily have the same mass. Uh, I want to speak about a very special case of these uh, entropy transport problems, which uh, we call the hellinger kantorowicz distance. This is because it's some kind of convolution between the kantorowicz wasserstein distance and the hellinger kakutani uh, distance, and yeah, I'll talk about some uh, problems, in particular about uh, geometric uh, properties like geodesic curves and convexity and stuff like this. So uh, if you want to know more about this, I refer to these three uh, papers. The first one gives you more motivational introduction to the topic, uh, some examples. Uh, the second one gives you the hardcore theory in the most abstract setting. And the third one, which is still in preparation, then uh, discusses uh, convexity of functions with respect to this uh, new distance. So, but before I get to the topic of entropy transport problems, I'd like to give you a little bit of, uh, of background, what's, what's our motivation, what's our objective. And what we do basically is we want to extend uh, what's usually called the Otto calculus, um, where you have uh, a differential operator of the form minus divergence of, uh, let's call it mu gradient psi, and we want to uh, generalize this to more general um, differential operators. Oops. To more general uh, differential operators, which in particular are defined for systems, so not only a scalar quantity, but you have a vector of, let's say, concentrations. You have a general uh, mobility matrix, so you, not, not necessarily the linear dependence uh, on the state that you have in the Wasserstein case. And what's the most important point is we want to add a reaction term. If you consider this, you can uh, generalize the famous binamu brigny formulation and introduce a distance in this way. We have now a generalized uh, continuity equation, and then you, you can ask several questions, for example, is this really a distance? Is it quasi-distance? Is it a pseudo-distance? Uh, do minimizers of this problem exist? Can you give a characterization of the geometry that is associated with this distance? Uh, what's the topology induced? Uh, what, is conve what does convexity with respect to this uh, distance mean? And what are metric, metric gradient flows? OK, so we were successful in this case here, which is slightly simpler. Uh, in particular, we only consider scalar quantity u but we add a reaction term which accounts for the uh, generation and destruction of math, uh, mass. Uh, and here basically we have a Wasserstein transport part um, and here the uh, reaction part. And in some sense, uh, this is a convolution between the Wasserstein distance. So if you forget about this term, you get the Wasserstein distance. If you forget this term, you get the Hellinger distance. And so in the, in the language of convex, analysis, this is some kind of uh, convex inf convolution. OK, so let's get to entropy transport problems. So um, I will always assume that my space X is a polar space. You can generalize this to arbitrary Hausdorff spaces. But to keep things uh, simple, I'd like to uh, suppose it's Polish. Um, M should be the space of non-negative and finite uh, Radon or Borel measures in this case. And on x, I fix a cost function. And then, of course, you know that if your measures mu0 and mu1 don't have the same mass, this problem here doesn't make any sense because you can't find a transport plan. What you can do now is 
you can uh, assume that only a certain fraction of the mass is transported. Yeah? Not all the mass is transported, but only a part of the mass is transported. So you consider plants eta whose marginals are just absolutely continuous with respect to the measures mu. Unless you fix a certain mass that is transported, this also doesn't make a lot of sense because then the transport is always zero. Okay? So and to fix this, what we do is we add entropy functionals which take the densities of the transported uh, parts of the mass with respect to the measures mu as an argument. And in this sense, they penalize the deviation uh, of the transported measures with respect to the measures mu i. And we have, an, uh, 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 of course, the transport part, which gives you the effective transport. So this is an uh, interpolation between absorbing mass uh, or generating mass and transporting mass. And this is what we call an entropy transport problem. So what assumptions do we make? Uh, we shall assume that the entropy functions are convex. There's at least one positive number in the domain. This is just to exclude some trivial cases. Uh, they, are lower they should be lower semi-continuous, and I will also assume that they are superlinear. But this can be weakened by introducing some, some weaker uh, compactness assumptions. Uh, the cost function should be proper, so meaning it's not uh, equal to infinity, lower semi-continuous. In particular, I will especially allow the case that uh, the cost is infinite. Okay, some examples. Uh, first, a trivial one where the uh, cost for the transport vanishes. In this case, we basically give up completely any spatial dependence of the problem. And you see by Jensen's inequality, because the entropies are convex, that then only the total mass of the measures enter, and you are uh, uh, basically what you obtain is this scalar minimization problem, where only the total mass of the measures enter. Another trivial case is where you assume that the entropies are given by indicator function in one. And this now means that you can't have any deviation of mass. And this reduces, of course, to the case of optimal transport. OK, a more interesting example is when you assume that the cost is given by the indicator functional, uh, function on the uh, uh, diagonal, which means you uh, explicitly prohibit any transport. And then you can choose, for example, f to be the what I call Boltzmann entropy, and then you obtain the so-called Hellinger distance, which basically is the L2 distance of the square roots of the uh, densities of mu naught and mu one with respect to some reference measure. But you can also use different entropy functions to obtain, for example, the Shen, uh, uh, Shannon divergence and, and other interesting uh, examples. We can also look at uh, only one of the entropy functions f being the indicator function in one. This means you just fix the mass for one measure, and then what you obtain is basically the JKO scheme. OK. So another case which will be, diff uh, which will be important for the second part of my talk is when you fix f to be the uh, Boltzmann entropy and the cost to be this very strange uh, function here, so minus 2 logarithm of the truncated cosine here. So in particular, if you are above the threshold of pi over 2, the cost is infinite. OK, and this, uh, I will show later that this example really corresponds to a distance, what we call the hellinger kantorowicz distance. And in particular, it's induced by this uh, Onsager operator here, which is a generalization of the Otto calculus. So the important point here in this example is that you really have a sharp threshold for the transport, which means that if you have points whose distance is, far, is, is larger than pi over 2, there can't be any transport between these points. There can be only an absorption of mass or generation of mass, but no transport. OK, so a first result. Uh, if you assume that the entropy transport problem is feasible, feasible means in this case there exists a plan such that the functional is finite, which is, for example, the case if uh, the entropy functions at zero are finite, because then the uh, null plan is, a, uh, is a, a plan for which this is finite. 
And if this is the case, if we have feasibility, then we can find an optimal plan. The set of optimal plans is convex. If we further assume that the entropy functions are strictly convex, then we know that even the margin is eta here. Where are they? Yeah, basically here. Uh, they are also unique. So and this in particular means that in the case of strictly convex entropy functions, the uh, uniqueness of an optimal plan for the entropy transport uh, uh, um, formulation is just the property of the transport part. So if you know that the corresponding transport problem has a unique solution, then also the entropy transport problem has a solution in this case. This is, for example, the case if you take x to be rd, uh, c is induced by some strictly convex function h, and you are in the absolutely continuous setting, then you know by the uh, um, uh, standard results of optimal transport that you have a unique solution of this problem. Okay, so far so good, not very exciting. Uh, what's more interesting is that uh, similarly to the optimal transport uh, problems, you can give a dual formulation in terms of optimal potentials, and you have the same convex constraint that you also have an optimal transport, but in contrast to optimal transport, your objective function is not linear in the potentials anymore, but you have some concave uh, objective function. And these concave functions, G0 and G1, which can be uh, written in terms of the dual of the entropy functions, they take into account that you have some parts of the mass that is just absorbed or generated, but not transported. You can also do a transformation by introducing a new coordinate psi and to arrive, uh, to arrive at a, another dual formulation. The two formulations are uh, equivalent, and now the objective functional is linear, but you get a more complicated constraint here. And here the functions H0 and H1 are uh, basically the, the genre transforms of the reverse entropies. And if you consider the case of the uh, indicator functions in one, you see that H1 and G1 uh, coincide and they are given by the identity, which means you're in the setting of optimal transport. Okay, to see that this is uh, uh, true, that, or, or how we can derive this dual formulation, we recall that uh, as f is convex, we can write fi of s as a supremum of f fine functions, where the coefficients uh, satisfy these constraints, or this one, which is equivalent. Then we use this, plug it into the entropy transport formulation, uh, use the min-max theorem to uh, interchange here the minimization and the maximization, and then the red guy here turns into the constraint, and the blue guy becomes the objective function. Okay, so as a nice byproduct, we get optimality conditions from this. So the first one reads exactly as in the case of optimal transport problems here, but the second one links your optimal, uh, optimal potentials to the optimal densities. Here, sigma i is the density of the transported uh, uh, fraction with respect to your measure mu i, and this condition now links the two. And this optimality condition is sufficient in the sense that if you have a plan for which such potentials exist, which satisfy these, uh, these conditions, then you know that your plan is also optimal. If you are in a more regular case, for example, uh, f, uh, f of i in zero is finite, then you also have the necessity of this condition, which means that a plan is optimal if and only if such uh, optimal potentials exist. Okay, so let's look at, at an example. The example that will be important later, where f is, again, this Boltzmann entropy, and c is the strange cost function, then it's easy to compute uh, the function g, which is given by 1 minus e to the minus phi, and h, which is, which is just the uh, minus logarithm of one minus psi. Then you get the equivalent formulation here, and your optimality conditions simplify to this nice identities here. So the product of the densities is equal to the cosine, to the co truncated cosine square, and uh, the optimal potentials are given by minus logarithm of sigma, uh, uh, respectively, psi is equal to one minus sigma. Okay, and this is, this is very helpful later on if you want to give a characterization of the geodesic curves. 
Okay, so now it becomes mysterious. Uh, it, I, I want to show you now that you can give uh, a different, a third equivalent formulation, which is not possible in the case of optimal transport problems, and this has really some, some remarkable properties. And for this, I shall assume that my measures, uh, that, that I'm in the case that not only the uh, transported measures eta i have a density with respect to mu, but also mu has a density with respect to eta. This is, of course, in general not true, but it will keep the argumentation now a little bit simpler, and the more general case is essentially the same. So um, I have now a density rho, and rho is the inverse of my density sigma, and with this density, I can now write the entropy functional, which was integrated with respect to the measure mu. I can now integrate it with respect to the measure uh, eta. And more, I can write the whole entropy transport functional just with respect to the transport plan eta. Okay? So to shorten notation, I will call the integrand here h. And now comes the crucial step which you find in the theory of young measures. Uh, namely, I relax that I have a pair of density and measure. The, the pair I can identify with the measure on the product space in the sense that uh, I can recover it since uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this is concentrated in the in the density, so I have the Dirac concentrated in the density here, so that basically what I do is I add an additional variable. So instead of using, using the density, I add a new variable. And now, instead of con, uh, uh, considering this, general, uh, this, this measure, I allow for a more general measure, gamma i, which is defined on the, on the extended space x times uh, the uh, uh, open half line. So what I do, as I said, is I introduce an additional variable, and now the link of these general measures to my measures mu is that mu is the barycenter of these new measures defined on the product space. So here I will use the uh, notation p to uh, denote the barycentric projection of these measures. So what I do is I give up that I have uh, a density associated to a point. Instead, I have a whole distribution, a measure, associated to each point. This concept I can now use and rewrite my minimization problem. So I consider now plans gamma, which are uh, defined on the uh, product of the extended spaces, such that the marginals um, of these plans have barycenters given by mu. I will call this the homogeneous marginals. And then I can rewrite the minimization problem in this form. And since this is a convex problem, Janssen inequality tells you that the minimum is still the same. Okay? It's just a different way of writing it. So one last step. Uh, the barycentric projection has a natural scaling invariance, meaning that I can rescale this additional variable r, uh, for example, by multiplying with some uh, uh, factor if I do this re, uh, inverse operation to the measure. So in particular, I will fix uh, a function theta positive, define the scaling function of phi theta in this way. So I rescale the R variables, and then I introduce a new plan, a rescale plan, gamma theta in this way. So via the, via the push forward with respect to phi theta, and I also multiply with theta then I still have that the marginals have barycenters mu i. This I can plug in into this minimization problem. And now I can do an inner minimization. Now I can minimize with respect to theta because theta was arbitrary. And what this gives me is a function c given in this form. And this is convex and positively one homogeneous with respect to the r variables. And why is this a good idea? Because now I found an equivalent formulation, which reads like this. The entropy transport problem is equal to the minimization of some cost function, C, with respect to a plan gamma, which lives on the product space or on the, on the extended space. 
such that the marginals of this plan have barycenters given by mu. So this looks like an optimal transport problem, but now the marginals are not fixed, so it's part of the problem to find optimal uh, uh, marginals. So basically what we do is we look for the best optimal transport with respect to marginals gamma that have barycenters mu. Okay. So let's get to the hellinger kantorowicz distance. So uh, as you've seen several times now, uh, this consists of entropy functions given by the Boltzmann entropy and the strange cost function. This I can plug in into the formula on the uh, previous slides and compute that the cost is given by this formula you see here in red. But this formula you know from high school, right? This is the law of cosines for a triangle that has an angle given by the distance of the point x0 and x1 and has, has side lengths given by the square root of, rho, uh, of r0 and r1, right? Just the law of cosines. But there's more because this actually gives rise to the cone space construction and Christian is an, an expert for cone spaces, uh, but I will still try to uh, uh, give my... Uh, uh, a definition of cone space. So basically what you do is you consider the extended space Y, which consists of the space X extended by the half line, and then you identify all, point, all points X zero. So you collapse all points for which R is equal to zero into one point. This is then the tip of the cone, which you can see here, for example, in a 1D example. And you can define a natural distance on this cone in this way here, which is just a generalization of the law of cosines. Yeah? Note that here I rescaled my variables. So instead of R0 and R1, I write R0 square so the, to have a better geometric interpretation. But this doesn't change anything because I can just rescale my variables. But I also have to do this transformation in the Barry centers. Now, so in this uh, projection P. Okay, with this I now find that my uh, logarithmic entropy transport problem is equivalent to computing the Wasserstein distance on the cone space, but not with fixed marginals, but with marginals whose uh, barycenters are fixed. So it's, again, part of the problem to find the optimal pair uh, gamma naught and gamma one here. It turns out that uh, this gives rise to a distance, which we call hellinger kantorowicz distance. Uh, the space of non-negative finite measures on X is a complete and separable metric space. If X has the same properties, uh, you have that this distance here metrizes the weak topology on M. This means uh, uh, convergence with respect to bounded continuous functions. Uh, you can find optimal lifts, so they exist, and of course an optimal plan, and you have, as you saw in the, uh, in the introduction, you have no transport over distances larger than pi over two, so oh, let me draw a picture of what this means precisely, so let's look at the supports, supports of the measures mu naught and mu, mu one. I can now consider the pi over two neighborhoods of the supports. And then everything that's inside of these neighborhoods, this is transported, but everything here is absorbed completely. There's no transport, just absorption. And here I only have generation. Okay. So uh, then let me talk about uh, geodesic curves with respect to this distance. So now I will uh, restrict myself to the case of x being equal to rd, but basically this works in an arbitrary geodesic space x. Uh, and uh, of course you know that in this case the Wasserstein geodesic curves are induced by the geodesic curves in the space x, meaning that if you have an optimal transport plan mu, a geodesic curve 
is given by the push forward of this optimal transport plan with respect to the geodesic interpolator, which in the case of ID is, of course, just the uh, convex combination. Uh, yeah. Okay, and now the case is that for the hellinger kantorovich distance, you have something similar, but not uh, with respect to the geodesic curves in X, but with the geodesic curves in the cone space. So you have the following result. If mu is a geodesic curve with respect to this hellinger kantorovich distance, then you can find a probability measure pi which lives on the continuous functions uh, with values in the cone space such that pi almost every curve is a geodesic curve in the cone space. You have that the uh, push forward of this uh, uh, dynamical plan pi with respect to the evaluation map. So the evaluation map is uh, just so you take a curve oops, z let's say from 0, 1 to the cone, then E t of z is just z of t. Okay, this is the evaluation map. And you have that this push forward of this dynamical, dy dy dynamical uh, geodesic plan is in fact a geodesic curve in the Wasserstein space on the cone. And if you project uh, this geodesic curve on the, in the Wasserstein space via the barycentric projection to a measure in, uh, on X, then this gives you mu. And even more, uh, if you consider the push forward uh, of pi with respect to ES and ET, then this is, gives you an optimal plan for uh, gamma S and gamma T. So to, the key to understand the geodesic curves in the, in the hellinger kantorovich space is to characterize the geodesic curves in the cone space. And this is actually quite simple because we can identify the tangent space on the cone space for point Z, which, has, which is given by the equivalence class X0 and R1, uh, R0, which is not the tip, uh, uh, with Rd times R. And on this uh, tangent space, I can introduce this uh, uh, scalar product. Note that here I have the fuck factor R0 square. And then I can compute the geodesic curve in, this, in the direction of a tangent vector and find these formulas. So R square is given by this uh, term here. So it's a nice quadratic function. And X is given by this form with the uh, arcus tangent or arctan. Okay. If I have a, a function given on the cone space, zeta, which has this form, so it's given by uh, a, a function psi of x times r square, then I can compute the gradient of this function on the cone space. This is then given by the gradient of psi and r psi. So the reason why I choose the symbol psi here is that psi will become the optimal potential from the dual formulation. Yeah? And if I use this characterization here, I can compute the geodesic curves in the direction of the gradient of this function to get this form here. Okay, let's look at a simple example, namely two Dirac measures um, concentrated in points x0 and x1, whose distance is below this threshold, and they have uh, different total masses, a0 and a1. Then I can compute the geodesic curve. This is again a Dirac concentrated in a point x of s, but this time uh, you have a non-constant speed, which is given by the speed function theta here, and even more, the mass, the total mass of this Dirac uh, uh, curve is not constant anymore. So you have a changing total mass along the transport. So uh, how does this exactly look like? So the, here you can see a plot of the speed function, uh, basically for different mass configurations. So if your initial mass is much larger than your final mass, then at first you are really slow because you want to absorb mass along the transport. That's why your transport is at first very slow so that you have time to get rid of the mass. And then in the end, if you got rid of the mass, you're really fast. And in the other way around, if your initial mass is low and the other uh, one is quite big, then you are very fast at the beginning because then transport is cheap and then the mass is generated. That's where we become slow. You can see these examples 
here for equal masses where you have this almost parabolic shape uh, of the transport and here is the case that the initial mass is, um, is small so you're really fast then you build up mass and here the other way around you're slow to lose mass and then you're fast okay and I can show you a more sophisticated example so what you see here is a, a family of Dirac measures concentrated here on the line and they are transported into one Dirac measure which sits here in the corner you can see here that this uh, uh, critical threshold of pi over 2 kicks in so all the Dirac's that are beyond this threshold they are just absorbed they stay where they are and the other Dirac's they move to the Dirac measure but with different speed in particular the closer you get to the threshold the slower you are and you can also see that you are you have a, a, a varying total mass along the transport okay so this was uh, yeah the case of Dirac measures if we are in the lucky situation that our measures are absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue uh, measure then we can also give a ex more explicit characterization of the geodesic curve namely we know that our optimal transport plan eta of the entropy transport formulation is actually given by a transport map this is just a, a, a small extension of the result that you find in the green book by Ambrosio, uh, Gilles and Savare so you have a transport map here which generates the plan and this transport map has this form here which you already saw in the characterization of the geodesic curves on the cone okay then by the optimality conditions you also can link the densities of the transported uh, uh, masses to each other so sigma sigma 1 was the density of the measure eta naught with uh, eta 1 with respect to the measure mu 1 and this is then given by this uh, uh, formula here you can also write it in this form where you use the uh, identity between the or sort of identity between the optimal densities and the optimal potentials okay so with this now you can write the transported part of your measure mu1 or, or mu i which I shall denote by the prime here uh, this, so this is the transported part this is the part that is not transported and for the transported part you can write uh, this part uh, with respect to your measure mu uh, uh, not prime and with the density given by this guy here and here you have the transport map and this in particular means that if you have a geodesic curve and you know that you only have transport then you can write down the density of this geodesic curve which then takes this form here it just follows from an interpolation of this uh, formula basically okay how much time? 10 minutes, wow. Okay. So, and now, since I can characterize my geodesic curves for absolutely continuous measures, I can, uh, um, I can investigate what it means for a function to be convex along these, um, along these curves. So, I will consider functionals of this form. So, I have an internal uh, energy and I have a potential energy. Here C is the density of the measure mu with respect to the Lebesgue measure, so C for concentration. And we, we, we know that in case of the Wasserstein distance, we have the so-called McCann conditions. So if, uh, so my, my potential energy here is convex if and only if this map here is convex and non-increasing, which is equivalent to this uh, chain of estimates and even more I know that the potential energy is lambda convex if my function V here is lambda convex on the space X in case of the Hellinger Kakutani distance we can also explicitly compute the geodesic curves which are given by this form so here we have uh, the square roots of the densities of the measures mu naught and mu one with respect to some reference measure it doesn't matter which reference measure uh, so we have also this kind of uh, uh, parabolic interpolation between them and then we can check that this 
potential energy here, uh, this internal energy here, is convex if and only if this map here is also convex, which is equivalent to this estimate here. And now we can ask the question, so the hellinger kantorowicz distance is an interpolation between these two distances. So what does this tell us for the convexity conditions? And here I now define a function g in this form. So maybe you see the uh, resemblance from the last slide. So here I have r to the d, e to the r minus d, which is also here. And for the Wasserstein, uh, for the Hellinger distance, I have u times e uh, of 1 over u square, which you can also see here. Now we have the following result. First of all, for the potential energy, this is lambda convex if the lifted potential v to the cone space is convex on the cone space. Yeah, this is not very surprising since the geodesic curves in the hellinger kantorowicz distance are basically induced by the geodesic curves on the cone space. So this makes sense. For the internal energy, we have the following result. U is convex if and only if G of R and U is non-increasing non in R. Sorry, this is miss R. No, it's here. So this map is non-increasing, which is the same as in the McCann condition. And I also have that G is convex, but now jointly in R and in U. So, okay, this means that if I fix now, for example, U, I get exactly McCann conditions. So if U is fixed, this corresponds exactly to McCann's condition for convexity. If I fix R, I exactly get uh, the uh, convexity conditions for the hellinger kantorowicz distance. But the convexity with respect to hellinger kantorowicz distance is not equivalent to these both conditions. You get a stronger conditions because you have the joint convexity in R and U. So this is a stronger condition. And this, can, uh, this you can see if you actually write down what this condition means. So in red here, you have the, uh, uh, the monotonicity with respect to R. Yeah, here, epsilon 1 uh, is C times E prime of C. E naught is just E. And e, uh, epsilon 2 is C to the power 2 of, the, of E pr uh, double prime. And you can see that the joint convexity condition is now equivalent to this matrix being positive semi-definite. And you can see here that on the diagonals, you have McCann condition. And here you have the hellinger kalkutani condition. But the off-diagonals give you a new condition, which you can see, for example, if you test this uh, with uh, V being 1 and minus 1, and then you find this condition, and this is a new condition. In particular, it does not involve the second derivatives of E, so it's not really a convexity condition, but still it's a stronger condition that you have to impose to get convexity with respect to the hellinger kakutani distance. Okay, so uh, maybe I cut here a little bit. So uh, just let me briefly sketch uh, what we are doing. So we found an explicit characterization of the densities of the geodesic curves. So what we can do now is we plug it into the density of the entropy or energy functional and then compute the second derivatives. So this is, uh, in particular, you have here an ex explicit form in, in T. Okay, this gives you then this, these three expressions here. This, you know, is positive. This comes from the uh, McCann conditions. This is also positive. This comes from the uh, monotonicity uh, in the McCann conditions. So, and this is the matrix B, which we assume to be positive semi-definite. So this is also positive. So everything that's, that needs to be done now is to check whether these guys here in red and in blue are positive. If you can prove this, we've shown convexity. Okay, but these are really, really nasty. So what we do first is we compute uh, these terms for t equal to zero. So just at the initial point. And when we do this, so here we can basically use Taylor expansion and so on. Then we find these identity, uh, identities here. This we can plug into these two expressions here. And then we find that the red guy is just the uh, uh, norm of the gradient of the optimal potential psi square. And the blue guy is given by the Hessian of psi square minus the Laplacian square over D. 
So these two guys are positive. So in the case t equal to 0, this is fine. So how do, do, what do we do for the general case of positive t? And here we can use that the restriction of a geodesic curve to some sub-interval t1 is again a geodesic curve, but now starting at mu of t. So and here we uh, can use the fact that for the determinant delta at t plus theta 1 minus t, where theta now is a new parameter which gives you uh, basically the, geo, the new geodesic curve, uh, for this determinant you have a nice product formula here. So this is given by delta of t, where t now is fixed, times some new function dt of theta, which again has a form of, of a determinant. Here t is basically the Jacobian of your transport map, now evaluated at advanced, at an advanced potential psi of t, an advanced gradient g of t, which is not necessarily the gradient of psi anymore, and an advanced Hessian uh, of, of psi. And the same holds for the density of this geodesic curve. Uh, and now you can compute the derivative with respect to theta here to obtain basically the same identities you have for the case t equal to zero. So they are the same structure. On the other hand, I can now also uh, compute the derivatives of the left-hand side here uh, to find these identities. This I can use, plug into the formula, and then I see I get the same result. So this is uh, to check the convexity. And finally, uh, let me give you some examples. So what's quite depressing is that the uh, logarithmic entropy is not convex with respect to the hellinger kakutani distance. And to check this, you use the formula for g. You check uh, it's non-increasing in r, so this is good. It's convex in R, which is also good, but it's not convex in U, which basically means this functional is not convex with respect to hellinger kakutani which also means it's not convex with respect to hellinger kantorovic Okay, then we look at power laws. So C to the power P. Can check G is given by this form, and then do some computation, and then you see this is indeed convex in the case that P is uh, equal or, or bigger than one. You can also uh, consider root-like uh, uh, functions, so minus c to the gamma. Um, the gamma is now uh, 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 below one. And you can check that in the case of d uh, equal to one, so in the one-dimensional case, uh, this function is convex in the case that gamma is in the closed interval one-third to one-half. In the case d equal to two, you check that this is only convex if gamma is equal to one half. So this is the only case in two dimensions, and in three dimensions, so this is not. Uh, there's no case where you have geodesic convexity. Okay, so I think uh, I stop here. I don't want to read this, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.